Todd Phillips 2019 film The Joker um, was one of those films that touched on the geist of our time and um, it was associated with many contemporary phenomena such as issues to do with class, poverty, gender issues, culture wars, um, incels, uh, populism, Trumpism and all this other sort of sort of contemporary phenomena but I want to uh, point out actually that the film tapped into something um, in reference to more contemporary phenomena it tapped into some kind of ahistorical eternal issues of social psychology I was reminded of some of these issues when I watched the second film uh, the second film has gotten has gotten much worse reviews than the first film. It's clearly an inferior movie. Um, and I want to point out why, uh, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, but um, in, the, in the end of the first film, we have a crescendo of public anger. Um, Arthur Fleck, Joker, uh, ends up publicly killing Murray, the chat show host, and this leads to a larger display of public anger. And the second film is much more conservative, actually. Um, it doesn't end with public anger. It ends with the death of Joker. The Most of the film is sort of circles around um, the contention between Arthur Fleck and Joker. So the film is about Joker's trial after the, the, the murders that he commits in the first film. This, the second film depicts the trial of those murders. And uh, the, the key issue really here is, um, um, is Arthur Fleck crazy or not? If he's not crazy, he'll be given the death penalty. If he can be argued to be clinically insane, he'll be spared the death penalty. So his lawyer, who, his lawyer who's, a, who's a kind of liberal woman, um, wants to save him from the death penalty. So she gets involved and argues that he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's crazy, but blah, 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 kind of infantilizes him in some sense. Um, and then the, on the other side of that, you have uh, people who say, no, he, he knows exactly what he's doing, and he, and he, des he, deserves, the, the, he deserves the death penalty. But um, at the end of the film, Joker is killed not by, not by the state, but by one of his own followers. So uh, the Joker has, at this point, many followers and fans. Wherever he goes... There's a lot of media attention and a lot of support. He's, he's famous. He gets um, a lot of admiration from a certain sector of the public. And, and the kind of supposed irony of the second film, the ending of the second film, is that he's killed by one of his own fans, one of, the, one of his friends in Gotham, in the uh, Gotham Asylum, ends up stabbing him crazy person just ends up stabbing him so the so the 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 message is much more conservative it's it's you know be careful what you wish for um once this anger is released only bad things can happen in the, this violence is senseless um uh, it's not worth becoming the joker you, you should have remained just simple old ordinary loser nobody arthur fleck and the second film hasn't resonated with people nearly as much as the first film, which says something. So uh, I want to I want to take it doing a, a sort of a sort of film analysis of the first film, and I'm going to do so by using certain chapters from none other than Sigmund Freud's um, "The Future of an Illusion." So "The Future of an Illusion." Is a film is a, sorry is is a, is a book which Freud wrote about religion and about the future of religion and the kind of social psychological function of religion kind of analysis of religion in context to the rest of his work. It's more in the so it's more in the social psychological camp than in, in the kind of individual clinical camp of Freud's work and. Uh, the first, so I'm actually going to put aside the question of religion for a moment here and just replace religion with uh, culture in general, a public displays of, or 
public engagement with myth, storytelling, and meaning in, in a more general sense. This book, the first few chapters of this book, offers us like a really good theoretical framework in order to um, analyze the Joker film, the first Joker film. The Joker offers us a depiction of social societal conflict but not typically from the perspectives of economic struggle or legal struggle it offers us a insight into psychological tension and psychological struggle and now it offers this not as a psychology which is the byproduct of economic tensions or the byproducts of legal disparities but it offers it as a a kind of tension and struggle in and of itself a kind of psychopolitics um something which is not the byproduct of some um base simply a superstructure which is the product of some base in marxian terms but it's 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 in a sense its own base it's its own it's its own thing in the first few chapters of the future of an illusion freud offers us a uh, a understanding of civilization as being something which is in some sense beneficial to us it protects us it offers us wealth uh, organizational capacity security and so on but it also comes with a certain restrictive and repressive aspect and what Freud is interest, interested in, and I think this is a, a, a important concern for all therapeutic modalities, all psychologies and psychiatries, is how those restrictions and releases, the restrictions of civilizations and the releases uh, from those restrictions, how those are managed on a kind of political level almost. Um, how those... Uh, how those restrictions and releases are distributed a kind of psychic economy of distribution between people in a society so just to read um, about a page or so from this text freud says if we turn to those restrictions that only apply to certain classes of society we encounter a state of things which is glaringly obvious and has always been recognized. It is to be expected that, that the neglected classes will grudge the favored ones their privileges and that they will do everything in their power to rid themselves of their own surplus of privation. Where this is not possible, a lasting measure of discontent will obtain within this culture and this may lead to dangerous outbreaks. But if a culture is not gone beyond the stage in which the satisfaction of one group of, of its members necessarily involves the suppression of another perhaps the majority and this is the and, and this is the case in all modern cultures it is intelligible that these suppressed classes should develop an intense hostility to the culture so i just want to point out something here just uh, not necessarily an intense um an intense hostility to uh, the privileged people but a, a, a an intense hostility to the culture itself okay i continue reading a culture whose existence they make possible by their labor but in those uh, sorry but in whose resources they have too small a share in such conditions one must not expect to find an uh, sorry in this in such conditions one must not expect to find an internalization of the cultural prohibitions among the suppressed classes in, indeed, they are not even prepared to acknowledge these prohibitions, intent as they are on the destruction of the culture itself, and perhaps even the assumptions on which it rests. These classes are so manifestly hostile to culture that on that account, the more latent hostility of the better provided social strata has been overlooked. It need not be said that a culture which leaves unsatisfied and drives to rebelliousness so large a number of its members neither has a prospect of continued existence nor deserves it, end quote. Okay, so that is a uh, section of uh, the future of an illusion in which Freud is sort of pointing out something fundamental here about repression, which I think is often missed uh by 
overlooked by, you know, I don't know, the general understandings of psychology and Freud and so forth. The realm of repression and restriction is not simply um, we have a civilization, therefore, in some sense, there's laws, there's behavioral codes, there's moral codes, and this restricts us and represses us and causes us to be somewhat neurotic or very neurotic, depending on the person. But there's, the, the, there's a kind of more political aspect to this in which, in which there's a, a, a kind, of, kind of mechanisms um, of restriction and release, which may be in some sense unfair or unequal between different classes. So when um, a society has, you know, a, a general mode of restrictions and repressions, but a particular group is, you know, we could say in some sense not more repressed than, uh, than another group, but they are, uh, uh, but but their restrictions and repressions are less well paid for. They're less well uh, compensated for. Um, that group will resist internalizing the codes and culture and morality that the more privileged classes will internalize. Now, this explains precisely why you have a difference between working class character, at least this is the kind of Western framework uh, of, of understanding this problem, working class character and like middle, upper middle class character. The middle and upper middle class people, in some sense, they internalize and identify with their, with their society's moral restrictions much more, much more uh, fundamentally. And the more working class people are more likely to see those restrictions as external to them yeah, they have to obey the laws, yeah, they have to sort of not say this or not say that or do this or do that, but it's kind of external to them. It's just simply, if they don't do it, they'll be punished or something bad will happen. Whereas the, the more privileged classes really identify and internalize this. And I think this is exactly what you see with, for example, political correctness, which is middle class and upper middle class people are much more likely to really, really believe the sort of uh, moral fads and codes and, uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, fads and codes and demands of their society, no matter how stupid and contradictory and um, uh, nonsensical and inconsistent those those codes and fads are. Whereas working class people, they're more likely to kind of point out how stupid it is or how pointless it is or, you know, uh, this doesn't mean that they're always going to completely outwardly rebel against it. It just it just means they haven't internalized it as much. So I think it's an important to note here that a a a, a society on a psych on a kind of modern civilization on a psychological level has a has a tension between groups who have internalized the culture's norms and codes and a group who may obey them to some extent but sees them as external to them. This is also something which the German sociologist Norbert Elias pointed out in his text, The Civilizing Process. He says that uh, the civilizing process is basically a, an increasing, increasing expansion of the internalization of those moral norms. So when the middle class, for example, expands, and the big expansions of the middle class happened in the 19th century. Um, it happened in the late 20th century. And probably to a certain extent, we could also say, you know, with the bourgeois revolution, uh, the French, after that, there was also a sort of, there was also a sort of uh, probably a larger inclusion of a certain amount of people that were excluded from society, blah, blah, blah. But I think the 19th century and the, the kind of mid to late 19th century probably and the, and the kind of late 20th century, mid to late 20th century are probably the two big expansions of the middle class that we can point to. And, and we see in both instances, I would say, a, um, uh, a process of more expansive and radical internalization. Just to reference this back to the Joker to kind of give this cinematic analysis that I'm trying to give here, is that we see in the Joker that the 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 people that have uh, re have resisted and rejected 
or gave up on, perhaps they did internalize and they eventually gave up on it, the society's moral demands and character and the people that have still internalized them or uh, hold on to that internalization, that gap reveals itself quite radically in the Joker. It's, it, it rem- and it should remind us of populism today. It's kind of w- within populism, there's an increasing uh, group of people that are, are, are rejecting those moral norms. They're, they're sort of, uh, uh, they're externalizing them. They're, they're, they're identifying them as something which, are, which is simply imposed on them and, it, and is annoying to them. And they don't like, even if they obey them to a certain extent, they don't see them as being part of their own identity. And then you have the other people more kind of progressive people, cosmopolitan on the left, upper middle class people, and so on and so forth, the elites for the most part. Um, although perhaps with Trump, you could say he's an expression of this of this externalization. But the but but the non-Trumpian, non-populist kind of technocratic liberal elites, they're an expression of this internalization. They identify with these with these norms. Now, what is important here is also how these sort of norms and these and these morals and these codes um that which is either internalized or externalized is represented collectively among the people and i think here uh, uh, we don't need to simply say religion we can also expand this to i would say you know public culture media mass media culture uh, television shows movies um art uh, uh, kind of historical narratives, um, all of this kind of public mythology, public narrative, public storytelling, regardless of whether it's formally religion or if it's kind of secularized versions of this, this is all key to understanding the um, um, the 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 conduct of these of these restrictions and releases and internalizations and externalizations. Now in the Joker. This is important because what we see, and this is something Slavoj Žižek has pointed out about the Joker before, which is that, which is that the mythology around Batman itself is being played with in the film. So, for example, in the typical Batman films, the Waynes are these kind of really noble, lovable, philanthropic kind of uh, American aristocrats, basically, and and this mythology is is challenged right this mythology is challenged by the joker and by the joker's followers and this and by this outbreak of public anger uh thomas wayne is depicted in the joker film to be a sort of cruel cold idiot figure he's just a kind of obnoxious kind of impish awful man there's nothing noble about him at all and um this is very different to how to- someone like thomas wayne is normally depicted in 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 any other uh, any other depiction of of the batman universe the gotham universe um similarly the person who murray kills sorry who 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 arthur fleck the joker kills is a figure of public storytelling and public meaning uh, murray the friendly chat show host the warm welcoming lovable kind of paternal figure kind of you know kind of vulgar liberal indulgent uh, paternal figure but nonetheless a kind of public paternal figure and he is revealed in the film also to be actually behind the scenes to be this uh, kind of exploitative man who uses arthur fleck's mental illness as a as a kind of um a skit to make fun of him and so on. So he's depicted in this way. So we see the undermining here of certain um, of certain public figures who represent, embody a specific historical uh, moral character. So just just to point to uh, this next section I'm going to read. And when Freud here says art, I want you to sort of postpone a more elitist view of art for just just for the sake of this uh theoretical um argument and uh, don't think of art just as in like the mona lisa and beethoven i want you to think of art in the more general sense of you know public media of any kind 
um, just even entertainment of any kind, I think is probably a more specific way to put it for the Joker film. Uh, entertainment here is, uh, is as I will try to explain now, a, a, an expression of this art. Okay, so I will, I'll keep reading. Um, okay, quote, different in kind is the satisfaction that art yields to the members of a cultural group. As a, so different in kind, different. Uh, as a rule, it remains inaccessible to the masses who are engaged in, in exhausting labor and who have not enjoyed the benefits of individual education. As long as we, uh, sorry, uh, as we have long known, art offers substitutive gratifications for the oldest cultural renunciations, still always most deeply felt, and for that reason serves like nothing else to reconcile men to the sacrifices they have made on culture's behalf. On the other hand, works of art promote the feelings and identify sorry the feelings of identification of which every cultural group has so much need in the occasion they provide for the sharing of highly valued emotional experiences and when they represent the achievements of a particular culture thus in an impressive way recalling it to its ideals they also sub uh, they also subvert a narcissistic gratification changing the page one second uh okay so actually actually i'll stop there okay so here again we have this understanding of of art as one of those mechanisms by which a civilization sort can can sort of recompense recompense and compensate for a society's restrictions and sacrifices so here we're talking about repression in a much different way than we will normally talk about repression in a kind of more biological understanding of repression, which is sometimes in other Freud's other texts a little bit. I mean, sometimes he's he's the sociologist and a little bit more of the philosopher, and sometimes he's the he's the uh, kind of more more in the kind of I think clinical understanding. And this is definitely in more in the sociology and the psycho and the uh, f more philosophical understanding of things. But the point is. Repression shouldn't be understood as like, you know, um, uh, restricting an energy in some sort of mechanical or scientific sense, restricting an energy, restricting a, an, a, an instinct in some sort of biological sense. Yes, there's an element of that to it, of course. But the, 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 uh, the repression is, is caught into a symbolic world by which recompensing and compensations are uh, achieved so art is one of those things uh, public art and people engage in public art they experience art and so forth it's sort of rewarding them and acknowledging their uh, sacrifice that they make these the, the sacrifice of restriction within a civilization and that sacrifice is represented by art according to freud it's represented by art. It um, creates an identification with that sacrifice. So again, we, we speak of the internalization of, of moral norms and the internalization of that repression rather than it being something which is simply imposed externally. Uh, to represent that art and to identify with it and feel proud of it. And this is, this is important because this, this is a thought, this is a, thymotic problem which means it's to do with recognition and pride not to do with sexuality to represent to feel proud of those restrictions to feel proud of your work and have it represented and rewarded publicly this is a mechanism by which civilization can uh, facilitate the internalization of repressions and uh, uh, get people to kind of more freely and more proudly we could say in a sense make make their sacrifices for their communities and for their societies so for example when uh i don't know some sort of like woke hollywood uh production takes your beloved 90s or 80s film or tv show and kind of throws it into the blender and 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 uh, uh, uh shits out <laughs> this horrific sort of sort of a uh, uh, hyg hygienic you know, politically, politically correct um, 
mockery. Uh, people feel really offended by this. And, they, and people often say, well, well, it's just a film or it's just a TV show. Why do you care so much? Well, they care exactly for this reason, that, that, that these shows are in, are in some sense a way of identifying and recompensing people for their restrictions, for their uh, repressions, for the sacrifices they make by participating and uh, and obeying the civilizational norms. So within within this realm of identity politics, um, you have this sort of picking out certain groups of people to to recompense and to compensate and leaving other groups out and uh this is actually quite quite significant on a social psychological level if we take what freud's saying here seriously because repression is caught into a compensation politics basically it's not simply about restricting an energy or in, or instinct it's it's about how it's a bit about how those restrictions are recompensed here we could say something like um you know a, a slave and a citizen may actually be sort of restricted psychologically and behaviorally in ways which are not that different and and perhaps sometimes even in, in modern societies we could say maybe there's more uh, restrictions and repressions on people than there was for slaves, you know, in, in, <laughs> in ancient Rome, I don't know. You know, if you, if you think about the technological changes, if you think about these sort of advances in behavioral management, uh, the, the incorporations of technology and science into these restrictions, into these behavioral controls. I mean, if you think about people who are, who are filmed when they're at work, for example, you know, if you think about all the kind of weird health and safety codes people have to obey and, and all the stupid bylaws people have to obey. I mean, there's lots of reasons actually to think that like a peasant was in some, was in many ways far less psychologically restricted than like a upper middle class person working in, you know, a finance company or something. Like, honestly, this is real. The, the, the difference between those two, um, those two the people is that one group is recompensed for their for their restrictions while the other group isn't. A slave or a peasant generally isn't really recompensed. He's not represented. He's not, uh, he's not, he's not, uh, he, he doesn't participate in the rewards of the, of the, of the society, even though he may be less restricted by the society. So the, the line between, you know, for people who are free and people who are slaves uh, is not to necessarily to do with having more kind of personal freedom. It's to do with the recompensing mechanisms. But those recompensing mechanisms are both are material, they're economic, they're legal, but they're importantly also done through uh, identification and um, art and representation as well. But therefore, it takes on a thymotic dimension of recognition. So I want to bring this back to the Joker, just one last time before I stop the video. Um, in particular, the scene between Joker and Murray. And, uh, you know, they're sitting there on live television. And Murray asks Joker, you know, why did you do this? Why did you kill these men on the subway? And so on and so forth. And the Joker's answer is, you know, uh, typical in some sense, he says, well, no one cares about people like me. You know, you ignore us, you walk all over us. And why should we obey your rules? And why should we um, do what you want and smile politely for the camera when we're not sort of recognized, basically, for our own sacrifices? But he says something which is probably more specifically relevant here in relation to humor. And I think here uh, humor could be seen uh, as as a part of that public art and that public representation and that recompensing for for your restriction and your sacrifices that you make within a civilization. Um, humor is very much, I mean, first of all, on a psychological level, humor is cathartic, it's therapeutic, it releases tension, and it also it also allows a certain subversion of of a uh, of certain moral restrictions and social taboos we see this 
uh, kind of subverting of the of the uh, kind of I think blatantly in some sense um, exploitative and unequal mechanisms of public art. So for, so think again, the Joker's well, Arthur Fleck, his video of his own stand-up comedy was shown on the Shot Show, and everyone laughed at him. They're laughing at his expense. They're they're uh, relieving themselves of their own frustrations caused by society by laughing at him. He's the he's the butt of their joke. I think here you could think of many examples of this happening on like American television chat shows, making fun of people from the Midwest, for example, you know, hillbillies and so forth, making fun of working class people and so on and so forth. Um, uh, the Joker completely subverts their, their mechanisms of release in this scene. And that's why it's so genius. He completely subverts their mechanisms of release. He says he killed those three guys in the subway and uh, our, and the chat show host Murray asks him why and he said uh, because it was funny and Murray says I don't get it like I like where what's the punchline and he's like there is no punchline they were awful and when Murray asks you know do you realize this is this, this is not funny this is not a joke he says well hold on a minute isn't humor subjective so here's the exact quote from this scene, which I think is most important here. He says, uh, after he says, well, hold on a minute, humor is subjective. Joker says, um, all of you, the system that knows so much, you decide what's right or wrong, just like you decide what's funny and what's not. So here we have a sort of, we could say a sort of psychological state of exception, a kind of therapeutic state of exception where where there's a authority that gets to determine uh, what those releases and compensations for for repression are, you know, humor being one of those releases and compensations for your for your restriction and for your sacrifice. Uh, there's a kind of a th it's not just an open an open game where uh, we can you know have time off and we can uh, kind of shoot the breeze and laugh at things. You see this within the realm of political correctness that that there is clearly a sort of authority which determines this is what you can laugh at, this is what you you can't laugh at, which basically means in Freudian terms, this is what can be a recompense, and this is something that that is not a recompense, and that also means for who, who gets to who gets to be represented, who gets to have a. A release and a, a, a compensation for their restrictions and who doesn't get to have a compensation for their restrictions and of course at the end of the film what happens of course is live on camera completely disrupting the uh, the mechanisms of uh, recompensing and releasing people from their restrictions and entertaining people you know uh, letting them shoot the breeze after a, a hard day being miserable <laughs> because of modern civilization the, the joker ends up just killing uh murray and therefore he completely he destroys the psychological mechanisms of of um of release and compensation and those kind of particular mechanisms of release and compensation for a particular group of people who who are allowed to laugh and be, be cruel and be callous at someone else's expense turns into a real physical kind of widespread more universal state of chaos which uh, in in which basically represents the failure of those systems of restriction and release turn into a just a much more direct violent uh, proto-revolutionary or full revolutionary release which is rioting murder and so on and so you know it, certain people were criticizing this film and saying it just depicts a kind of senseless violence a senseless anger it doesn't you know it's not a kind of or a political organization against the system that can replace the system with another system sort of 
sort of thing, um, which you sort of see in other films like, I don't know, V for, v for Vendetta, for example. You know, there's a kind of liberal democratic rebellion against, against the totalitarian regime. I suppose it's going to replace it with a liberal democratic government or whatever, right? Which is exactly the government that we've had for a long time, and it's the one that makes us all miserable. But anyway, that's a different thing. The point is that the, the, the point of the Joker isn't to, you know, offer you a political solution. It's to show you what the result and what could happen if you maintain this completely kind of exploitative and uh, particular and um, uh, sort of kind of kind of classist. There's a kind of class element to it, to, to kind of contradictory, class contradictory, as, as the Marxists would say. Uh, mechanisms of psychological release and restriction if your public and social forms of of uh compensating people and including people in a representation identification and compensation for their civilizational restrictions if this mechanism becomes very exploitative i would say decadent degenerate commodified uh, uh particular elitist um and so on and so forth you can come up with many different adjectives to describe this um it risks kind of failing on a wider level and 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 uh, and uh, erupting into like full blown uh full blown hostility basically this is not designed to give you a sort of formulaic structural argument for why the system is bad and for what should replace it it's to show you the psychological uh, the psychological conditions and dynamics by which full-blown uh, violent conflict is is, um, is 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 probable this is why we shouldn't um, we shouldn't uh, identify these cultural tensions and peculiarities, no matter how stupid they can be and petty sometimes and idiotic they can sometimes be. We shouldn't simply categorize these things as being uh, less important than law, than economics, um, than geopolitics and so forth. Uh, Freud here offers us an understanding of kind of the axiomatic and fundamental nature to social psychology and to public myth, public uh, per pub participation in forms of identification, uh, restriction, release, and compensation, and all these, all these categories I've been talking about. These are, I would say, axiomatic to the functioning of a civilization, and they have not been given their full due. The Joker film, I think, beautifully shows us how axiomatic they are, and perhaps that's a that's a lens by which we need to look at societal conflict and and uh, social tension through.